Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Exodus, please. Exodus chapter number 12. Amen. Exodus chapter number 12. Before we do that, um, I've been praying and I uh, believe we've got leadership on it. I think we ought to go ahead and add the East Step family to our family of missionaries. And uh, I need all in favor, raise your right hand. All right, any opposed? All right, we will put them on. I'll let him know, Miss Brenda. We'll make sure we get that information. Um, I have a total. I don't have it in here with me right now. I've got a total on the faith promise. And I uh, appreciate your faithfulness and giving. If you've not yet got a card in, you want to do that, it's fine. Go ahead and put it in there. I did get a total. I'll, I'll bring that in tonight. And I apologize for not bringing in this morning. All right, Exodus chapter number 12. Stand with me, if you will. We'll read verse number 1 through verse 13. Very familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, I'm trusting the Lord to help us as we go through this message. I really I want to make sure we get to uh, a certain portion of this message. The Lord has really, I, I believe, built the message around uh, one particular part. That we'll get to in a few moments. And I know, I know, common sense would say, why not just drop the rest of it and get to the point? Well, it's kind of like an arrow. All right? Nobody shoots the point of an arrow. But it is the point that's important on an arrow, right? So we got to go down the arrow for a few minutes before we get to the point. All right, don't you love that? I, you know, every now and then I get a bright flash. It's kind of like lightning. My thinking is it's one bright flash and it's gone. All right, verse number one, Exodus chapter number 12. The Bible said, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening." And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast it with fire, his head and with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. Ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. They sh that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts now through this passage of Scripture. Help us, Lord, to magnify you. And Lord, to see you high and lifted up. I pray, Lord, for the power of God. I ask you, Lord, that you would please... Use me as a vessel and a mouthpiece today for just a little while. Lord, would you please put a gate upon my lips, help me to say everything I should say, and Lord, not one single word I should not say. We love you, we trust you, Lord, to do great things now in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Very familiar ground that we're walking in this morning as far as Scripture is concerned, and uh, I would love to tell you that uh, I'll be preaching a lot of new things. This is not necessarily new. and We don't have anything new in the Bible. It's all been preached up one side and down the other through the years. And uh, you get nervous. Somebody gets in the pulpit and said, I got something new from the Bible. You ought to go ahead and mark it down and get nervous about that. 
Uh, because it's not new. Now, they might have got a fresh touch on an old truth, but it's not new. This Bible's been around and it's been preached, and we're dealing with something very familiar as far as this uh, Passover lamb is concerned. There's been a great deal of preaching and a great deal of good preaching from this passage of Scripture. Many songs have come out of this passage of Scripture. The, uh, the wonderful song, When I See the Blood, I Will Pass, I Will Pass Over You, directly from this passage of scripture and the truth that is presented here. Tonight, uh, today, I want to look at this passage and, and preach a message, I guess, entitled a little bit differently. You've heard it said, it's what's on the inside that matters. Is that right? You've heard that said before. I want to preach this morning on sometimes it's what's on the outside that matters. Sometimes. Now, I understand the thought behind it's what's on the inside that matters. I understand the concept of it's the heart that matters. And the Lord, the Bible tells us the Lord looketh on the heart. Amen. And we understand and know that what's on the inside is very important. But sometimes it's what's on the outside that makes the difference. You think about that, uh, that, uh, those, those, the milk carton that you get at the store. Uh, and most of you ladies know this. Some of us men may not think anything about it. If it's got it in the store, it's obviously good. Somebody say man. So the date on it's not all that important. It's in the store. It's got to be good. And uh, so we may not look at it, but those ladies, they'll look at that date to make sure uh, that it's going to be in the refrigerator for a few days, make sure it's going to be okay as it's in that refrigerator. Can I tell you, if you get a jug of milk and you have not examined that little date that's printed on the outside, it could adversely affect that which is on the inside. Amen. And nobody want to buy milk and have cottage cheese come out of it. I don't want buttermilk to come out of it. I don't want sour cream to come out of it. I get milk, I want milk to come out of it. And uh, you say, well, you, you're supposed to take milk and let it sour and make it into this and make it into that. No, that becomes something different. Sour cream is sour cream. It's not milk. You don't drink it that way, I don't drink it that way. But I will say this, that little printed spot on that jug makes a big difference and it's on the outside. Amen. Tell me if the outside of your car does not matter, why was it such a big deal when the grocery buggy hit it? Why, when you came down to your car and you saw that big scratch where somebody walked along beside it and, and, and scratched down the side of it, why did you act so unchristian if the outside does not matter? Sometimes what's on the outside is a real big deal. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this passage of Scripture and probably your mind has already got there uh, for, for some of you. As we look at this passage, I want to go through and, and look at a couple of things. Number one, I want to bring your attention to the introduction that we're given here in Scripture. In verse number three through verse number six, we're introduced to a character that is going to be very very prevalent throughout the remainder of Scripture. We've heard of this character one other time back in Genesis chapter number 22. There was not a lot of detail given about the character there, but we're introduced fully to this character here in Exodus chapter number 12. We're given the details of the role this character is going to play throughout the remainder of Scripture. And this character we are introduced to here in Genesis 12 is the Lamb. You'll hear a lot about the Lamb. We sing songs about the Lamb. We sing about worthy is the Lamb. We preach about the Lamb. We pray about the Lamb. We worship the Lamb. Why? Because of the things we learn about the Lamb in this passage of Scripture. Remember when uh, Abraham was taking his son up the mountain to sacrifice him, his son looked and said, where's the Lamb for the burnt offering? And God said, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's really all that's mentioned there. We know the beautiful picture there of the, the, the ram called in the thicket and the substitution. But we're given some details in this introduction uh, that we need to understand as far as the lamb that is coming. You see, this lamb that is mentioned in Genesis chapter number 12 is the Passover lamb, but it's not the Passover lamb. 
You see, it is a figure, it's a picture pointing forward many years down the road to the Passover, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which would take away the sin of the world. So we're introduced here to the Lamb. Notice the description of the Lamb in verse number 3. Speaking in all the congregation of Israel, saying to the tenth day of this month, they shall take of them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house, if the household be too little for the lamb. Now let me just throw this out there. You'll notice the Bible did not say if the household be too big for the lamb. Can you imagine the preaching that would have come if the Bible said the house was too big for the lamb? There'd be, there'd be crazy preachers out there preaching, well you better get in before your brother does because your house might be too big for the lamb. And you know they're out there, so you might as well smile about it. Somebody would have come up with a message that said, get saved before your sister does, just in case your house is too big for the lamb. There's nuts out there that would do that. But just as a little side note, really not a part of the message, the Bible said, if the house be too little for the lamb, he said, you can share it, but don't ever worry whether or not the lamb's big enough for the house. Don't ever worry whether or not there's not enough lamb to go throughout the whole household. Don't ever be concerned or whether or not the lamb's big enough. But if the lamb is too big, feel free to share it. Amen. That's a side note, but it's a pretty good side note. The description of the lamb here in verse number five says it is a lamb without blemish. That's important because of the fact that we're, we're, we're prefiguring here a picture of Jesus Christ to come. It's important that we understand that one day we're going to look from, from this passage of Scripture to the Gospels of the Lord Jesus and we're going to hear Him declared to be the Lamb of God. And it's it's very important that early in Scripture, God points out the purity and the, and the qualifications of the Lamb so we would understand when Jesus Christ comes, everything that is said about Christ becomes important. You can't run over a passage that says, I find no fault in Him because it ties us back to this passage of Scripture where they said it was a Lamb without blemish and without spot. So it had to be a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year. One requirement spoke of its purity. The other spoke of its prime. Had to be a male of the first year. They say of those lambs, as they some say it's anywhere from eight weeks to a full year old. Most agree that it's a lamb somewhere around the age of one year old, but not older than that. And they say the peak of its prime strength is in that latter part of that first year. That's when it's strong, it's full of life. The vitality of that lamb is at its fullest. Can I tell you, our Savior was not a weak Savior. Our Savior was not a Savior who had his life taken from him, but our Savior in the prime of his life was a Savior who laid down his life for you and I. You say, well, if he had been any stronger, they would have never crucified him. Not so, Brother Ken. He was as strong as he needed to be. Amen. He had all the creative power of God. Somebody say amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And without him was not anything made that was was made. All the creative power of God was in Jesus Christ. The, the hand that meted out the heavens with a span is the hand that is attached to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about all the weight of the world has been laid on his shoulders and he bore it without a burden. I'm not, I'm not serving and worshiping a weak Savior. This was a Savior in the prime of his life with all the strength and power and vitality of of, of, of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So we see the description of the Lamb. He was pure. He was in his prime. Notice the display of the lamb in verse number six. The Bible said, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall keep it in the evening. This was a, a process or a time when the lamb was put up and he, they would inspect the lamb. During this time that the, the lamb was put up, they would go out daily and 
probably some even more than daily would go out there and, and they would begin to comb through its wool and they would begin to check its legs for blemishes because if it had a cut on its leg or it had a knot somewhere, it had some kind of tumor or, or bump in it, it was unfit for the, for the sacrifice. So in this display, it was a time of being scrutinized, a time to make sure this lamb did meet the requirements of a holy God. Can I tell you, Jesus Christ in His life was put on display before the world and the world watched Him and scrutinized Him. They picked Him apart. They criticized Him. But at the end of His life, just before He went to the cross, there was a proclamation that was made. I find no fault in Him at all. Can I tell you, anybody who has truly scrutinized and examined the Savior Jesus Christ has come to the same conclusion, thank Thank God that's I find no fault in him at all. For many years now I've been walking with the Lord and I've taken scripture and scrutinized him. I've been through scripture and I've picked him apart. Amen. Not trying to find fault but just trying to see his holiness and trying to see his perfection. And can I tell you without a doubt in my heart, without any reservation, I can lift my hands toward heaven and say I find no fault in the Savior. A wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. A wonderful Savior is He. We see the display of the Lamb. We see the description of the Lamb. Notice the destiny of the Lamb in verse number 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts. And, I'm sorry, verse number 6. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. What is the destiny of this lamb that has been chosen and, and put up and scrutinized and examined? It's not to become the family pet. They were not to take this lamb and bring it inside after they had scrutinized, after they declared that it was perfect and after they declared it was unblemished. They were not to bring it inside and say, all right, kids, become familiar with the lamb, pet the lamb, handle the lamb. That was not the command that was given. It was not to become the family pet. It was not, Brother Philip, to be tied to the doorpost. It would do no good when the death angel came through and saw a lamb tied to the doorpost. The death angel would still go inside and still take the life of the firstborn. The lamb had to be slain. It had to give its life a sacrifice for the sinner. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people today, they've become familiar with Christ. They've made a pet out of Christ. They love to handle Him. They love to talk about Him. They, they love to talk about how good He is. They live with Christ being the example but the fact is uh, you, we're not looking to Christ as the example we're looking to Christ as the Savior Christ did not come to be your family pet Amen. He came to purchase your redemption Amen. oh there's a lot of people petting Christ he, that's all He is is a pet say how do you know that well you only call Him when you want Him now tell me that's not the way you treat a pet <laughs> Sitting on the sofa. Some of you got house dogs and some of you got house cats and things of that nature. We got house kids. <laughs> Amen. Not to compare them with pets. They're far superior to pets. Amen. But, but we do have house kids. We used to have house dogs. We don't have any anymore. We turned them into outside dogs. One of them learned the value, very valuable lesson of not chasing a car, pulling a trailer. Sad day. Jeb looked back and said, huh, dog gone. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know that's bad, especially for some of you animal lovers, y'all. And I do love my pets. I, I, boy, I better get back to preaching. This is going downhill quick. <laughs> said all that to say this. You're sitting on the couch one night, one evening, and, and you get, you're watching TV or whatever, and you decide, you know what? I think I'm in the mood to pet my dog. So, and you call them, they jump up there and you pet them for a little while. You come in, sit on the couch and you're watching a ball game and your team starts losing. Get out of here. What are you doing? Oh, good grief of life. Every time I get up, I'm tripping over that dog and everything. The fact is, you're treating it like a pet. You want it when you want it and when you don't want it, you don't want it. Well, Jesus is not your pet. 
but you're treating him like a pet, man. Anytime you're in the mood to get around Christ, oh Lord, I love you. I want to be around you, but anytime you're upset and don't want anything to do with him, you say, why in the world am I always tripping over you? Why are you always in my way? Hey, Jesus is a savior, not a shepherd. And I mean a German shepherd. <laughs> the destiny of the lamb, it was to die. It was to die, it was to be killed. Then we see not only the introduction, let me bring your attention to the instructions that are given in verse number 7 through verse number 11. First instruction that was given was the application. The Bible said, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The first thing they were to do with the blood of the lamb after it had been slain was to take the blood and to put it on the door post. The man that was supposed to take the, the blood from the lamb that had been gathered and take it out and rub it on the, on the left side and on the right side and across the header over the door and that was what God was looking for was the application of the blood. You see, he could have taken the blood that he gathered and sat it outside the door, but it still had not been applied. And can I tell you all the blood of heaven, all the blood of Jesus being gathered is not enough unless it has been applied. I'm not looking for a bowl of the blood of Jesus. On my, hey, I'm looking for the blood to be applied. And that's what salvation is, the application of the the blood. We see not only the application, we see the appetite. The Bible said in verse number 8, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. I'm afraid today, and I, I'm not, really I think, I think all in all this is a positive message. But I'm afraid a lot of people have lost their appetite for the Lord Jesus. Some, it seems, is satisfied with the application. Years ago, you got the blood applied to your heart, and that was enough for you. So you no longer try to consume. You no longer are hungry. You no longer are trying to take in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're no longer trying to learn. No longer trying to communicate with Him. No longer trying to tone. Why? We've lost our appetite for God. What a dangerous time it is if we lose our appetite. Mandy, she pays attention to this kind of stuff a lot better than I do. Normally, when I'm sitting at the table, my food's in front of me, my head's down, and I'm centered on that food and making sure I'm making a direct deposit. You know, I mean, I want to make sure what's on that plate gets in me. I'm not watching to see what the kids are doing. I'm not watching to see if they're enjoying their meal or if they're finishing their meal or if they're cleaning their plate. I'm not watching that. I'm watching me clean my plate. Mandy, she's a lot different than that. She, she's watching the kids. She gauges them. Well, T bait half a chicken. Something must be wrong with him. He usually eats a whole chicken. I'm just using that as an example. But the other day, I remember Mandy told me, she said, something's wrong with Tinsley. Something's wrong with her. I said, why? She was running around and she was, she was smiling. She looked, her color looked good. She said, I said, why is something wrong with Tinsley? She said, she's not eating. I said, what do you mean she's not eating? She told me what she had for breakfast. She told me what she'd had for lunch, and she showed me what she was eating in supper. Said she's not eating. Something is wrong with Tinsley. Well, long ago, she looked at Teep and said, something's wrong with Teep. I said, how do you know something's wrong with Teep? He's running around. He's riding his bicycle. He's playing. What's wrong with Teep? He's not eating. He's lost his appetite. And you, do you know, Bad as I hate to say it, is this being recorded? We might want to mute things for just a minute so I don't have evidence about it. She's right. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like time bears it out that, you know what? Something was going on with Tinsley. Something was going on with Teeb. And, 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 and if I come to the table and I'm not hungry, something's real bad wrong. She looks at me, are you feeling okay? You're not, you're not hungry? You, are you okay? Are you, you dying? So, what's wrong with you? So what I'm saying is, when someone loses their appetite, something is wrong with that person. I was reading a book on fasting. It's talking about fasting your way back to health. And it said, humans are the only being in the world 
that eat when they're sick. He said, animals when they're sick, they quit eating. They don't eat. And through a process of time, their body heals and then they begin to eat again. He said, humans are the only thing in the world that eat when they're sick. I thought, hmm, what about that? Of course, he went on to get me under conviction and talk about how our God is our belly and, and everything else and that's what we serve. That's why we eat when we're sick. But he said, the application is this. When you're not right, you lose your appetite. And I'm afraid what has happened in our churches across America today is we've got Christians who are sick. And they've lost their appetite for the Lord Jesus. They're not reading the Word of God. They're not praying. They're not communicating with Him. They don't darken the door of the church very often. Maybe Sunday morning's enough for them. Why, why is Sunday morning enough? Let me tell you why Sunday morning's enough. You're sick. You've lost your appetite for the things of God. That's why you can come in on Sunday morning and get fed one meal from the table and say, hey man, that satisfies me for the rest of the week. I'm good. I don't need Sunday night. Don't need Wednesday night. Don't need revival. Don't need camping. Don't need anything else. Why? You are sick. And the problem is, if you continue without your appetite, eventually you're going to become anemic. Eventually, you're going to lose all strength. And eventually, you will die. You'll die. Because you can only live so long without eating. Only so long without eating. They had the appetite. They were to eat the flesh of the lamb. Well, hallelujah, you got quiet, didn't it? Application, the appetite. Thirdly, notice this, the anticipation. In the latter part, I believe it's verse number, verse number 10. And you shall let nothing of it, verse number 11, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I just want to mention the anticipation that they were to eat this lamb with. You, you've got to get the picture here. They've killed the lamb. They put the door. They've applied it there. They've now had the appetite. They've begun to eat. But as they're sitting at the table eating the lamb, their shoes are on their feet. Their fully dressed. They've got their staff in their hand. They're holding their staff. They're eating with the other hand, waiting for word to leave. Did you get that? They're waiting for the word to leave. Can I tell you, if the blood's been applied and your appetite is right, you're sitting with one hand on the staff listening for the trumpet to blow, and you're eating with one hand saying, oh, hey, hey, we're starting a journey real soon. One of these days I'm leaving, and while I eat and while I consume Christ and while I consume Consume the lamb. I am keeping myself ready with anticipation. For we are out of here very soon. Kendra, I appreciate you. Well, she's in the nursery, ain't she? Appreciate Sister Kendra. You can tell her I said so. I needed to laugh this week, and I, I got a good one. She sent me a little picture, a little caption. It said, the youth pastor fell asleep in the church staff meeting. It said they all snuck out laid clothes on the chair, and then blew a trumpet. So, can you imagine that, waking up, and there's just clothes laying on the... Woo, hallelujah. He got saved again whether he needed to or not. He said, I'm spiritual enough. I would have said, ha, ha, that's funny. I know I'm going to, yeah, I know what you've done until you'd hit your knees crying, I thought I was ready. Hey, Amen. Anticipation. Where is the anticipation in the people of God? Where are the Christians who are genuinely looking for the Lord's return? There's a generation that is passing off the scene that I believe genuinely were looking for the return of the Lord. I remember, Brother Robert, and you remember as well, I remember days riding by there and you'd see Papa wandering around in the yard and he's looking up in the air. Say so what? I believe he's genuinely looking for the Lord's return. He believed he was coming in his life. We talked about it. Me and Papa had talked about it several times. He said, I believe, Brother Mark, I'm going to see the coming of the Lord. And he is. He is. Dead in Christ arise first. Then we which are alive remain should be called up together with them and meet the Lord in the air. So shall ever be with the Lord. He is still going to be there. He's still going to see it. It just didn't happen in the time frame he thought of. Where are, where are the sky watchers now? 
Where are those that get up in the morning and say, Lord, this could be the day I'm going to live as if it is. Where are the ones that go to bed at night and say, Lord, if I rise in the morning, it'll sure be a surprise because I'm looking for you to come tonight and just pass on off to sleep looking for the coming of the Lord. Anticipation. So we saw the introduction. We saw the instruction. Now I want you to notice the inspection and I'll wrap things up here in just a minute or two. Notice with me verse number 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Notice the inspection now. And I don't want to lose anybody, so I'm going to try to explain it as I go through because I don't want nobody to think I'm, I'm crazy. Crazier. <laughs> Crazier, that's better. The death angel was not coming. God was not coming through the land to inspect the contents of the home. Is that right? He was coming to inspect the covering of the home. We've got this thing mixed up, I believe, where we believe that it is the contents that provide a covering, and it's not. It's the covering that changes the contents. You see, what happened in you when you were saved, you didn't suddenly become good enough for God to move in. You didn't suddenly become righteous enough for Him to accept you. He accepted you as you were. And when He saved you and the blood was applied, then He changed you. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, but all things become new. He changed you when he saved you. You did not change in order for him to accept you. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Within the door of the home, surely in all the land of Goshen, in all of that area where the children of Israel were, in all of that area where they had taken the lamb and they had put it up and they had inspected it and then they, they, they killed the lamb and they put the blood on the door and they had eaten the lamb and, and they were ready and their clothes were on and their shoes were on and their staff was in their hand. They were anticipating the coming of the Lord. They were ready. You understand, in those homes were liars, cheats, I find it hard to believe everybody in that home was righteous. Amen. They're the Old Testament version of Baptist. <laughs> you might as well smile about it, man. You read their history. They're up and down and faithful and not faithful. And they are the Old Testament version of the Baptist. Up and down and in and out and on and off. Just like everybody I know. Just like me. I have a hard time believing everybody inside that door was righteous. There were liars in there. There were cheats in there. Probably there were murderers behind those doors. No doubt there were adulterers behind those doors. There were law, the house was filled with lawbreakers inside the door. But when God said He came through, He said, I'm not coming to see what's inside. I'm coming to see what's been applied. Now here, here's what I want, to, I want to help you with. Some of you struggling real hard with who you used to be. Struggling real hard with who you used to be. Struggling real hard with what God saved you from. Struggling real hard. Some of you even struggling real hard with what you've be become after you were saved. Because some of you realize how unsaintly you are as a saint. Might as well nod. We're in good company. Sometimes I'm appalled at my unsaintly condition as a saint. And some of you are really struggling with that. How could God love me and who I was? 
How could God love me in the condition that I was? How could God love me even today in the way that I disappoint Him? Can I tell you, there's only one explanation that I have. He's not looking for adulterers. He's not looking for murderers. He's not looking for liars and cheats. He's looking for people where the blood's been applied. And when He sees you, He doesn't see you as an adulterer. He doesn't see you as a murderer. He doesn't see you as a fornicator. He sees the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And when He sees the blood, He looks at you and says, that's one of mine. And when that dawns on you, you're going to have a hard time remaining as calm as you are this morning because that excites me to know in spite of who I am, the blood's been applied. I've been blood bought and blood washed. I qualify to go to heaven not because of who I am, but because the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to my heart. And because the blood's been applied now, He works on the contents of the home. You say, you mean to tell me He he left adulterers in there? And I don't believe that. I believe everybody that was in there under the blood was changed when they came out. I mean, you think about it. You went in with one command. If the blood's on the door... God's not going to kill your firstborn. If the blood's not on the door, the firstborn's going to die. And imagine, as you're sitting in that home, you're eating the lamb, the blood's on the door, and all of a sudden across the street you hear something go, "Ah!" as a mother holds her limp son in her arms. And down the street, you hear somebody go, no! As a father goes into the room and sees his son lying dead. You tell me, I don't care who you were when the death angel came through and when they put the blood on the door. After you realize he passed over you, it did something. I imagine the next time a fellow got ready to tell a lie, probably said, Well, I guess I'll just tell the truth now. So why? Because the covering changes the contents. I want you to know I'm not preaching that it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. I'm preaching it does matter how you get there. You see, there's a lot of people trying to change who they are to become more like Christ. And you're doing the work and you're failing miserably and you're going to die and go to hell without God because you're trying to do all the changing. But if you just simply get the blood of Jesus applied, then He would begin to change you. The transforming power of Jesus Christ would mold you and make you like Him. And then you have changed the proper way. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus ye who are sometimes afar off made nigh by the blood of Christ. 1 John 1.7 But if you walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. And I tell you sometimes it's what's on the outside that matters. When it comes to your heart it's real important that the blood's been applied. What you used to be is not nearly as important as what you can be through Him. So why don't you just go ahead and realize that the covering is applied and enjoy the fact that you are blood-bought and let the transforming power of Christ make you what you cannot make yourself because that's the only way it will ever work. As we stand to our feet today, every head bowed, every eye closed,